Welcome to the March 17, 2009 edition of the Open Forum. Once again, we have this opportunity to look together into the Word of God. And, oh, what a wonderful privilege this is. I keep saying that night after night, not because it's just a, a, a cliché of some kind, but because it is true. It is so marvelous that we can look into the Word of God, particularly if we trust it all together with all our heart and soul. Oh, my, uh, this is very important that we have committed our life to what the Bible teaches. But if we are uh, listening to s s sources of truth other than the Bible or just parts of the Bible and not the whole Bible, then we can still be in real trouble. And that's why we want to encourage each of us to listen to the whole Bible. All Scripture, the Bible says of itself, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for correction and training and reproof and training in righteousness. Well, this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank, thank you, Brother Camping. Yes. In the last few shows, you've talked about uh, John 21:11 with the 153 fishes. And I had this other show that I listen to on the radio, Coast to Coast AM, which I hope you can get on sometime because I know they would want to talk to you about the end the times. Um, um, they were talking about that uh, the harmonic code for fish is 153, and that's why it's in the Bible in that verse. No, the 153... You see, God, uh, not every word in the Bible, but there are a number of words in the Bible that have a literal, physical meaning and also a spiritual meaning. Like the word mountain can mean a mountain, but it can also mean a kingdom. That's the spiritual meaning of it. Uh, the word horn, it can mean a the horn of a of a ram for, or of a bull. But it can also be a synonym for, have a spiritual meaning of strength. The word field, for example, uh, ordinarily is talking about a field uh, out there that we walk through uh, when we're out uh, away from the highway. And yet the Bible also indicates it can have a spiritual meaning signifying the whole world. Now, w numbers are words, and they too have uh, not, all, not every number, but some numbers uh, do have a spiritual meaning as well as a physical meaning. For example, the number three. Well, that means three things, whatever it is. But it can also signify that which is Pur the purpose of God. And the number uh, uh, 17, for illustration, it can be just the number 17. 17 objects of this or that, or 17 years, although it can also signify that which is uh, God planning to take to heaven. And, uh, and that is, and sometimes words are grouped together so that for example we have a sower that went forth to sow uh, and he sowed seed in uh, various kinds of ground now those several words uh, can be broken up and we know the ground is the heart of man the seed is the is the uh, word of God the sower is the one who is sharing that word and uh, and so on and likewise, a number can be a bigger number, but can be divided into smaller numbers in order to get a more complete spiritual meaning. Now, the number 153 
Yes, that can. There were exactly 153 fish, but when we look at the spiritual, uh, the spiritual meaning of that particular happening, those fish represented all those who were to become saved during the final, uh, the final harvest that would take place, uh, like it's taking place in our day. The net represented the fact that they were being caught into the kingdom of God. The fact that the net did not break meant that they, that, uh, they would uh, uh, definitely, they were truly saved. They were not wheat and tares. They were all like the wheat. Everyone was, every fish represented, or the fish represented true believers. The fact that they were dragged to shore and were not put in a ship is because spiritually the ship was was uh, typifying the church, and yet these were caught not by the activity of the local congregation, but as God uh, brought the gospel directly to the world. Now, by the same token, the number 153, uh, with that background information, we can understand what it is talking about spiritually. It breaks down into 3 times 3 times 17. God's, the number 3 is God's purpose. These 153 fish uh, represented the fact it was God's purpose that these would be taken into heaven. That's the number 17. And we see, therefore, that the spiritual meaning of the number is very uh, similar or very very similar to what is happening in the actual spiritual situation that God has in view and that is the way God uses numbers from time to time not always but quite frequently he does and this assists us in getting a lot more understanding of what God is teaching in the Bible. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I was speaking with a friend of mine who is in the church, and um, she was talking about... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, my, we lost that caller somehow. Uh, shall we go to our next caller, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I'm not taking any more calls, so I want everyone to hang up. As you said, this is my program. Now, yesterday I called Gary Wagner, okay, and I asked him, and I'm going to call Gabriel Otero, uh, Jeff Landis, and different preachers that I know, hopefully John... Hey, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Did you call yesterday? No, not yesterday. Uh, well, we didn't... I called uh, yesterday Gary Wagner. He's on KFAX at 8.30, and I want Gary Wagner to call in. He's from Reform Church. Excuse me. Have you called within the last 30 days? Uh, I don't uh, want to respond. Be honest. To be honest now. Did you? Yes. Please. Well, right. No, I, excuse me. Please. Uh, you're violating the rules, and that's very unkind, and we have all kinds of people that are trying to get through. And please, uh, please don't do that. That's a very unkind thing to do. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, when, uh, uh, what about those, uh, when, when the, uh, when the, uh, 2011 and, uh, Earthquakes. You know. What about the, uh, the all these atom bombs and things? Will they, will they go off too? Do you think they'll go off? Well, you know, the world keeps going on and on, thinking that they have uh, hundreds or, or even thousands of years in the future, and there's long-range planning for that. That's why there's so much could do, so much uh, talk these days about global warning, warming and so on. We have to start taking action now if we're going to save this world 50 years from now. 
and uh, and uh, this is because this world has been around for thousands of years and and a lot of people think for even millions of years and so the last thing in their mind is that this world will ever come to an end uh, and but the fact is God created this world and we know that it's going to come to an end now uh, the world knows no, nothing about that. It goes on, uh, on with its uh, uh, making new discoveries of one kind or another, inventing new equipment, uh, 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 finding better ways to destroy uh, each other, uh, and yet, and then also finding better ways to prevent each other from destroying each other. <laughs> you know, it's all uh, this has been going on uh, throughout the history of the world. And, but the fact is, completely apart from man's activity, here is God. He has his plan. And the wonderful thing, or the amazing thing, the astounding thing, is that he put into our hands a document called the Bible that was written right from the mouth, from the lips of God so that it is absolutely trustworthy and dependable. And God is letting us in on the secrets that we never thought we'd ever know. And one of those secrets is, is that God is showing us exactly where we are in time and that we're almost to that time when God is going to destroy the world. Now, when God does something, he doesn't need mankind to help him. He doesn't need a nuclear war to help destroy this world. No way. When God, for example, brings a, a big earthquake or a tsunami that follows right after, did he, have to, did he need any help from any human beings? When a great big earth hurricane hits the hits, uh, city, did, Christ, did God need any help to get, stir up that hurricane? Of course not. God is in charge of all of this. And when he is going to destroy this world, it will be 100% by his action and not at all by uh, something that man has done. It will be a result of the fact that man has to be punished for their sins and, and uh, God has uh, uh, some other plans uh, for those who have listened to him very carefully and become his children. But uh, 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 the fact is that we have nothing to do with uh, ending the world. Mankind has nothing to do with it. Uh, that is in God's uh, province altogether. Thank you okay. for... Have a bit. <laughs> okay. All right, I was just wondering... I, I'm sorry. What is your question? Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Uh, two questions. Um, bear with me, please. The first question. I know it's. I think it's in the first book of um, first chapter of Acts, and it's uh, talking about. The group of people or the Holy Spirit was poured out, and there was a mar married couple that withheld some of their 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 money from selling possessions. Do you, do you know which one I'm referring to? Yeah, Her name was uh, Sapphira or something. Ananias and Sapphira. They Correct. were part of the early church in Jerusalem. So it it appeared to me that they were endowed with the Holy Spirit, and then it records that both separately were died instantly because of their indiscretion and I was confused well, does that mean they is, were n the fact is they were not saved they, they were not filled with the Holy Spirit that is the evidence of this being that they received the judgment of God they were struck down dead because they told a half truth or a half lie however you want to put it but God is illustrating there that in that early church, while there was a lot of nice things going on, a lot of trust in the Bible, 
already the church was seeded with what the Bible calls tares or reeds that, that looked outwardly like they were true children of God, but in actuality were not. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, my second question, um, I've heard you say that, uh, and I don't know the exact place in the Bible, but God wrote on the hearts of man, um, basically a, a conscience or so to speak for a better word. Um, my question is, I don't know when in history that happened or if it was from the beginning, but why would it that be necessary if man has nothing to do with his own salvation? Oh, well, the fact is, God has given man a conscience so that he can live in this world. Our conscience is uh, showing us that God's law is written on our hearts. Now, mankind, if he did not have a conscience, uh, he could be ten times more wicked than he is, and this world could never continue. A man would destroy themselves, and it works. God works through the conscience of man to cause man to behave just a little better. Remember when the in uh, John 8 we read there about the woman that was taken in adultery, the Pharisees, who were very wicked actually, brought uh, her to Jesus to try to trap him, and uh, then... Uh, their conscience, and then as Jesus wrote on the ground and raised the question, he who is without sin cast the first stone uh, to kill this woman, and then their conscience began to bother them, and one by one they disappeared. And that's the way, that, so that even a man or a woman or a child who knows nothing about the Bible still will to some degree live in a in a way that is somewhat in agreement with many laws of the Bible, uh, even though they're not a child of God at all. Okay. Can I ask one more quick question? Yes. Um, I read recently in, I believe, John, where it talked about where um, he was in his mother's womb, and um, when Mary came with and was pregnant with Jesus that John was in, in the mother's womb, was endowed with the Holy Spirit, and did a flip in his mother's belly. Um, yeah. Now, there we have an indicator that emphasizes that God can save a person even before they're born. John the Baptist was six months from conception, three months from b b having been given birth, and yet he heard the conversation, the greeting between his mother and uh, and uh, Mary, and uh, and because of the character of that conversation, he leaped in the room to a uh, way of indicating that he heard, and and uh, uh, it made an impact on him, and that is an enormous encouragement to every mother who is concerned about the. Uh, the, uh, and every father, too, for that matter, who is concerned about the salvation of their children, get them under the hearing of the word from the time of conception. Don't wait and think, well, someday when our youngster gets old enough to understand, we'll start talking to them about the Bible. No, start while they're still in the mother's womb because uh, maybe that child will be stillborn. And yet, if 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 God intended to save that child, He could have done it be, because it is a requirement that God that a faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The child has to be under the hearing of the word. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. You're there. Yes. Go ahead with your call. Okay, I was talking to a friend, and we were talking about baptism now, and she's in the church. I understand that water baptism doesn't save, but she went and pointed out that full body submission is required, not just sprinkling on the head, and then she gave verses from Acts 2.38 and 1 Peter 3.20, along with others. 
if you'd like, you can take a look at those. Yeah, let's look at Acts 2, 38. There are talks about you have to be baptized in right. order to be a child of God. Let's look at that. We right. read there, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the fact is, is he saying you must be baptized in water? You read that there? No. no it doesn't say that. It's, but when we remember, when we look at any verse in the Bible, we have to see once is there anything else in the Bible that might relate. And when we look up the word baptism, we find that God focuses on water baptism, surely, but He also focuses on baptism in the Holy Spirit. That also is baptism. And when we uh, study the word baptism a little more, we find that the Bible teaches that it means to wash or to be cleansed. Well, we know that we're washed by water, but can water wash away anybody's sins? How does that work? Uh, water is just water. You can <coughs> pour water all day long on somebody and they're not going to get rid of a single sin. But what about this baptism in the Holy Spirit? What is all that about? Well, the Holy Spirit is God, and, and baptism is washing. In other words, you have to be washed by God. And how does he do that? With the washing of the Word. The Word, you know, the word of God has to be applied to our life, and then... And, and God, of course, has to do the work of making payment for our sin. And all of that has to happen before we are going to become saved. And so, uh, unfortunately, the churches fell into the same snare that ancient Israel did. They looked at circumcision and decided if, if a man is circumcised, that guarantees that he is a child of God. And the fact was, no, no. The, the circumcision was only an outward sign of the cutting away of some flesh, just like water baptism is an outward sign. But we have to have our sins cut away. That's the kind of circumcision that is required. But thank you for calling Camping, one more question, please. Y yes? Camping? Yes. Um, okay, so then I pointed out to her that all men, all men are born with sin, and then we ref I refer to Psalm 58, where it says that we are born, we come from the womb speaking lies, Psalm 58. Let's look at Psalm 58. Okay. And which because verse? Which verse? Psalm, um, Psalm 58, it's right at the beginning. Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. They're poisoned. Yeah. Now, what is your question? Okay, so my so so my question is: she went she went into the New Testament and quoted, you know, Mark ten thirteen through five and Romans fourteen twelve, where it says, where Jesus is saying, you have to be like a child to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Does does but that doesn't mean that a child is born without sin. Well, I'm, I don't quite get uh, the question. Is that? Uh, uh, every child is a human being and we're conceived and born in sin but on the other hand there are those who Christ made the penalty payment for their sins long before he ever created this world and so what does so, Jesus mean when he says to enter the kingdom of God you must become like a little child like in that, Romans 14 that, that, 12 that's talking about another thing altogether in other words, by nature, we're proud. We are, are egotistical. We are arrogant. We, uh, we may think we're real humble, but really, uh, we, if we really get uh, down to it, the nature of man is pride. And the, uh, we have, the Bible says that a, 
a broken and a contrite heart I will not despise. Uh, the Bible speaks about the meek, that is the humble, shall inherit the earth. And that is the problem, that uh, if we become a child of God, it shows up in the fact that we are become very humble, very uh, we recognize it's all the work of God. We didn't deserve it at all. But as long as we put a trust in ourselves in any way, it's because of our pride. After all, I did this, and and uh, therefore God worked through that in order to uh, complete the work of salvation. And that's a function of pride. But thank you for calling thank and so much. sharing. Yes, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Harold, Harold. Yes. Harold, uh, read um, Daniel nine twenty-five through twenty-seven. Can you interpret it for me? Daniel nine five to twenty-seven. Let's look at that. Daniel nine five uh, to twenty-seven. We have sinned. And this is Daniel praying and and oh my, it's a it's a it's a kind of prayer we ought to read every day to get an idea how we come to the Lord. And remember, Daniel is one individual in the Bible that we don't read of a single sin that he ever committed. Now he did that that did that didn't mean he didn't sin. But he was a very, very holy man, a very upright child of God. And yet, what's he saying? We, verse 5, we, that means me included all, or with all of Israel, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Now, you want verse 25. We go all the way back to 25. And he says there, of course, we have a, 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 not a part of his prayer. That's something else. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look at that right after this break. We have a caller asking about these three verses of Daniel 9. Uh, uh, Seventy weeks are determined uh, upon my thy people and upon thy holy uh, holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that going from, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And then, well, let me just read the next two verses. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end, therefore, shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even till the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, this language is very, very complicated, and uh, and uh, actually, uh, in the book of Daniel, it's a very unusual book in that it has a lot of information uh, that has to do with the end of time, and uh, well, also has to do with the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, giving us information that could not be found in many, most other parts of the Bible. But it has been sealed by God. We read in Daniel chapter 12, sealed this up till the time of the end. 
and it's in our time that we finally can begin to understand it. And the first thing, and it's one of the ways that God has uh, kept it from being understood is that Christ indicated in the New Testament that he spoke in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak. And Christ is the Word of God. And uh, until we understand that, we can't begin to understand these four verses here. The way that, because it says, the begin, it says in verse 25, Go th Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks and so on. But the fact is, and, and uh, theologian after theologian has tried to understand these verses and have never, never been able to come up with uh, a, a solution to what these verses are talking about. But in our day, God has opened our eyes to the fact that Christ spoke in parables and the command to, uh, to, uh, that's talked about here to restore and build Jerusalem actually is a command that was given to Ezra by the king of the Medes and the Persians in his day in the year... Oh, my, I, I don't even remember offhand... Uh, but it, 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 that command was given, uh, and and exactly 490 years later, I think it was 450, uh, 458 B.C., 458 B.C., and exactly 70 weeks later, of seven years, that seven, 490 years later, we get to 33 A.D., which was the year that Christ came and the, uh, where the Messiah was cut off in verse 26. And then God, and I'm not going into all the detail because this would take me uh, quite a while to, to lay out. We have produced a little booklet in Family Radio uh, entitled The 70 Weeks of Daniel 9. The 70 Weeks of Daniel 9. And if you're interested in the detail, you can send for that. It's free of charge, the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. But it does indicate that uh, that at the end of time, there it's talking here about the overspreading of abominations uh, and uh, the consummation, when everything will come to a total end. Uh, and uh, uh, the, here, God, is the timeline is... is uh, uh, not not uh, physical years as it is to the first coming of Christ, but it is usually a period of three and a half years to signify the New Testament era. But thank you for calling and sharing. And if you are interested, please call for anybody. Call Family Radio this, and ask for the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. And uh, we uh, there uh, we go through this well, word by word, these four verses to show how they are to be understood. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, um, good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, could you please read um, Revelations um, 9, um, verses 3 and 4? Revelation 9 is uh, 3 and 4. Revelation 9 is talking about the... Day of a judgment, how awful that will be. And in verse 3 and 4, it says, There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power or authority. The scorpions, uh, scorpions of the earth have power. And it was not, not commanded, but it was arranged uh, so that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented for uh, uh, five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he struck the man. Now, what is your question? Yes, my question is, from what I understand, this is going on during the five months after... 
on yes, May 21st. Is, it's going on during the five months that are the Day of Judgment. They, uh, as near as, uh, uh, it appears to be that they, these score, uh, locusts represent the church people. Uh, there will be about two billion of them in that Day of Judgment, I'm sorry to say. Oh, I could weep when I say that. Uh, but there will be about two billion of them uh, there at the Day of Judgment because they have not trusted when the Bible uh, told them told us that that uh, the end was almost here and that we, we weren't listening, we weren't trusting the Bible in all of that information. We, uh, we, in other words, we had our own kind of a gospel. Now, the believers have all been raptured. And, and the people who still ha have a Bible, although there's no salvation any longer, there's no longer any uh, grace or mercy of any kind, that's all gone, and yet they will be the authority with the Bible, and, and they will harass the, uh, the unsaved of the world that are there along with them, uh, which is, is another uh, more than four billion people. And, and tormenting them uh, uh, because they'll be telling them lies. They, they, they won't know what really has happened because they never understood the end time uh, at all. And, and it will be uh, just more suffering, bring more torment to those who are there uh, they, because really there are no answers at all. But that's, that's just in a very rough nutshell it is uh, uh, it, uh, this is a quite difficult language to uh, get tied down very very snug but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yes sir how are you this evening very well thank you sir I have a question for you tonight I'm coming to you with a little bit of a troubled heart tonight um it's not a necessarily a question out of the Bible, but I'm hoping you can help me. Um, I was baptized in 1997, but I don't feel as if I've lived like the Lord would have wanted me to in the past 12 years. And my question is, can you get baptized more than once? I mean, and try again, or, or is the one time that you were baptized, I mean... Of course, everybody's goal is to get into heaven, and I'm and I'm one of them. But I don't feel like I've lived like the Lord would have wanted me to live. And well, why? Or just, excuse me. I just me. don't know if I need to get baptized again and try again, or or what well, do I do? Well, excuse me. What 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 do you? How do you think water baptism is helping you get saved in any way? How can that be? That's the work that you do. All the work of saving a person has to be done by God. And, uh, and, in fact, God warns very explicitly that if you trust in any way that you have made a, uh, 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 took, taken an action, whether it's water baptism or uh, accepting Christ or making a profession of faith or, or joining the church or whatever, so that that assisted in getting you saved, it's guaranteed, and I owe... Oh, I, this is a, an awful truth, but it is an absolute truth. It can be shown absolutely from the Bible that you are not a child of God. We have to bear in mind that if we are saved, it was done 100% by the action of Christ. There's nothing, 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 nothing that we could have done that would have added to or made it easier for God to save us or whatever. It is God who had to do it all together. And so uh, the, that's why water baptism, while it is, uh, 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 it is a demonstration of the fact that even as water washes away uh, dirt from our flesh, so Christ has to wash away our sins or the Holy Spirit has to wash away our sins. And that's an action by God Himself. It has nothing to do with an action that we have taken. I understand. Thank you well, for calling thank, and sharing. Thank you, sir. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. 
Good evening, Brother Camden. Yeah. Um, I was calling to, I heard a message that you said something about stillborn babies and um, their souls. And I just want to know what happens to those souls, the souls of those babies. Uh, yeah. What happens to the souls of babies that are aborted or whatever? Aborted or, um, yeah. You see, it makes no... the. The fact is, I, I used to puzzle about these things, but the fact is that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who were, God made all the arrangements to save them before he ever created the world. They, uh, they already have had their sins paid for, and all that has to happen is that they have to be given a new uh, eternal soul and then on the last day they'll be given a new eternal body and that new eternal soul can be given to them by God as a little baby or it can be given to them an hour before they die or any time in between uh, and if they have been given a new resurrected soul it means that when they die whether they're aborted or whether they uh, live to be a hundred years of age they uh, they, uh, in their soul existence, will go to be with Christ in heaven, and then they'll re get a brand new body, uh, a resurrected body, uh, 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 when when Christ comes at the at the time of the rapture. Now, on the other hand, there are lots and lots of babies that are killed in uh, uh, in the womb that are. Uh, uh, that are, die at childbirth, or or or, uh, or they grow, they become a person and live to be a hundred years old. And God never intended to save them. It simply means that when they die, whether they died uh, by being aborted from the womb, or whether they lived out their life to be a hundred years old, the fact is, when they die, they're dead body and soul. They are dead. They never again will have conscious existence. And so so that little baby never enjoyed any of this earth because it was killed uh, right from uh, the mother's womb. The man a hundred years of, of age may have had a very delightful life and enjoyed this world a whole lot and uh, then but but when he dies he is dead that's the end of his existence and thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum uh yes mr camping i have two questions the first question is i'm kind of struggling with romans 7 7 through uh 25 in particular verse 15 through 16. Romans 7, verse 15 and 16. Let's look at that. Thank you. 15 and 16. We read, For that which I do I allow not, for what I would that do I not, but what I hate that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent under the law that it is good, that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Uh, now, actually, God is describing a, a true believer. We have a new resurrected soul that God has given us in which we never want to sin. We never want to sin. Uh, we, uh, we are uh, really hoping to live in a way that is always pleasing to God, and we earnestly try to live that way. But the po problem is we still are living in a body that has not been saved yet. It is just as sinful as it was before God saved us. And any time we take our eyes off Christ, uh, the potential to fall into a sin is there. And, uh, and it'll catch up with us 
when we're not, when we least think it will, because we're living in a very sinful world. Sin is everywhere around us, and in our bodies, we still love this world, and and it's very attractive to us, and so it's easy to fall into sin. However, we won't. There won't be anything at all like it was before we were saved. There's going to be a vast difference in my life than uh, if I'm a child of God than if uh, my neighbor who is not a child of God. Uh, Because when he lusts after sin, he lusts after sin both in his body and in his soul. Whereas I I will immediately discover I'm violating my soul in which I never want to sin again. Uh, but, uh, but I will have these desires that we read about here. Oh, Lord, help me, help me, that I might do it always thy way. And, and I, I wish I could live. This is really the plea here of Romans 7. I wish I could live without any sin whatsoever. And that's one of the reasons I long for that time when Christ is coming so that I can be in a body that will never sin, never have any desire to sin at all. And that's one reason we can pray, like in Philippians chapter 4, I believe it is, where it says, uh, Oh God, work in me to will and to do of thy good pleasure. We can pray God for uh, strength and for help to walk uh, more and more in a way that is pleasing to him. One more question. Yes. Uh, uh, when there is a new believer who is reading the scriptures and he's reading the Bible and he starts having physical ailments like sicknesses and uh, diseases come on, is that what we call spiritual warfare? No. Spiritual warfare has nothing to do with physical illness. Physical illness is because we live in a physical world. And and just because we become a child of God, we're not spared any of the diseases that uh, that unsaved people receive. But uh, uh, but the, the the difference is how do we live through these? An unsaved person might be very bitter toward God. Why 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 was I struck down with this disease? A true believer recognizes in this. Well, God knows about it. Uh, He must have a purpose in this for me. Uh, Maybe he's testing me to see if I, uh, so that I can use this uh, to examine myself, whether I really am a true believer. In other words, we look at it entirely different, disease and and, uh, death and so on, entirely different from the person who is not truly saved. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping. Yeah. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Great. Uh, periodically, I attend a fellowship uh, and a homeless shelter and in support of them, you know, uh, feeding, et cetera, the activities that go on there. And we listen to music also, which uh, is in worship to God. And now I'm under the impression that this uh, uh, violates Somehow, some way, uh, certain music that I've heard you uh, say is not appropriate. Well, is that shelter put there by a con- by a church? Is it under the authority of a church? No. Uh, it's, it's totally independent of any church whatsoever. It, it's, it has nothing to do with church. All, all all right. it- well, well, now, the fact that there's a shelter and they're feeding homeless people, that there's nothing bad about that. Right. And there's nothing bad about going there. Uh, but when it comes, and and to certainly put on some gospel music, there's nothing bad about that either. Right. Uh, but it doesn't take the place, of course, of personal worship, where uh, it uh, that is not really worship. Worship is sitting down with the Bible and listening to what God is saying, and that's on a one-to-one basis, mostly in our day, uh, and because God doesn't call for us to come together to do this. And as we pray individually uh, that and beg the Lord for for strength to do His will and and to trust in Him more and so on and so on, this is what worship is all about. 
one of our main objectives as far as like uh, being grateful as to what we have before us, and we do that through praying and all other activities, you know, in worshiping our Lord. Well, and also coming to uh, understand more and more what uh, what uh, Christ has done for us, uh, and asking that we might live more and more without sin, that we don't want to sin, we want only to do God's will. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Let's look at that. There we read. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun. It is common among men. A man in whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth. Yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. If a man beget beget a hundred children and live many years so that the days of his years be many and his soul be not filled with good and also that he have no burial I say uh, that an untimely birth is better than he for he cometh in with vanity and departeth in darkness and his name shall be covered with darkness moreover he hath not seen the sun nor known anything thus uh, this hath more rest this hath more rest than the other yea though he live a thousand years twice told yet hath he seen no good do not all go to one place all the labor of man is for his mouth and yet the appetite is not filled now uh, this is talking about natural man living in this world uh, we, uh, when everything is said and done, it's all emptiness. Finally, we've enjoyed this something out of this world, but we uh, we haven't solved the problem. The big problem is the sin problem. But uh, this is not talking about the forgiveness of sins. Uh, jump, jump to the last phrase, the last verse, couple of verses of of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the last two verses, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. In other words, if there's any evil found, the end is death, death. And so... All, the, all, uh, all you're ever going to have is what you have had in this world, and that is only a, 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 a almost nothing compared with the way God has created man in the image of God. So that potentially, if we got somehow got right with God again, we would be inheritors of the new heaven and the new earth. We would have eternal life. We would be in a in a situation that was infinitely more glorious and wonderful than the very best that this earth could offer, and for that reason, this earth, compared with what man could have, is vanity. And but the problem of getting into that new heaven and the new earth is sin, and that's why the closing two verses point to the fact that we have to recognize our sin and begin to search for a way in which we can understand how God provides salvation. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Mr. Tampin. Yes. Uh, I have a question um, in Romans 11. Yes. Verse 25. Yeah, Romans 11, verse 25, which 
is a verse that is very, very much maligned and misunderstood. Uh, there we read in Romans 11, For I would not, brethren, have ye ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out a deliverer. And we'll talk about that right after this message. We have a caller on the line who has a question about Romans 11, verse 25, which we just read. What is your question? Yeah, my question uh, that I have is, is in, uh, in 26, uh, why the Bible says uh, uh, verse 26, and, and so all Israel will be saved? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. The question is, because a lot of people is supporting Israel right now, you know, and then the, most of the churches and congregations, they think that Israel is the, no, the people in, of God. Yeah, I understand your question. And this, uh, these verses have been uh, gr grossly misunderstood and grossly misinterpreted by a great many modern-day pastors because they don't understand that this is uh, this is uh, 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 well let's let's start uh, let's start at the beginning of the chapter we read uh, first of all this cha this is an unusual chapter in that it is talking about national Israel and we can tell that because it's over against the G the nations or the gentiles who are not national Israel and God is explaining in the opening verses that that uh, it, it starts out, you know, uh, in verse 1, Hath God cast away his people? God forbid, uh, Paul is saying, uh, For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham. God hath not cast away his people. But then he explains that there is a remnant chosen by grace that do remain believers, but the rest are, uh, are, are uh, uh, they, their eyes are darkened. We read, uh, we read in, uh, in verse 7, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election, that is, there are certain people that were elected to salvation in the nation of Israel, hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. And he explains, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. All right, God is explaining here that there are two kinds of people in the nation of Israel, as there are two kinds of people in the whole world, for that matter, Namely, there are those who were elected to salvation, and therefore God has, has obligated himself to save them before they die. And there are those who were not elected, and in fact, they were blinded. Now he comes down to verse 25. I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant. He's talking to the Gentiles now about because he's discussing, he's talking to us about our Jewish friends, lest you should be wise in your own con conceits, that blindness is in part has happened to Israel. And he's explaining here how long that will continue. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now, the, when the fullness of the Gentiles have been saved, it means that God's salvation plan is finished. It means that all that God plans to save are, have been saved. And, it, and during that entire period of time, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, the character of the nation of Israel would be 
a, a remnant chosen by grace, a few people, a trickle of people becoming saved, were as blindness on all the rest of them. And so in this manner, all Israel shall be saved. Now that can apply both to the Gentiles as well as the nation of Israel. All those in the nation of Israel will be saved in this way with only a remnant chosen by grace and the rest being blinded. And all those who become spiritual Israel who are the saved amongst the Gentiles, they are saved this way just as a remnant uh, whereas the rest are blinded. And and it's hap- and they are saved because God has sent them the Deliverer, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that who came to take away the sins of those who would become saved. Now I still remember, I still remember very vividly in 1948 when Israel became the national Israel became a nation again. All kinds of churches were ringing the bells and all all excited, all excited that now national Israel would turn to Christ. All through the New Testament era, they had not been a nation and and it was hard to find a, a Jewish person who had become a true believer. But now it'll all change. And I still remember very vividly thinking, oh no, 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 you're not reading Romans 11 accurately. Well, now we're 60 years past that. They have been a nation amongst the nations of the world, a viable nation for over 60 years, and there is still only a tiny little trickle of them who really trust in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, whereas the great multitude of them, the biggest part of them, are still blinded. And that's the way it'll go be right up until the last day. This verse, these verses are uh, uh, one of the most beautiful proofs that the Bible is the Word of God, that all of this was predicted 2,000 years ago that they would be a nation again and that indeed they would still be in unbelief and uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it has happened exactly as God has uh, predicted it would. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, Brother Kemping? Yes. I have a question on uh, the economy. I know the rapture is coming close, and we see things failing throughout our country and throughout the world. Are things going to continue on this course until the rapture occurs, or will things improve for a while? Uh, Should we put any faith in the stock market anymore, for example? Um, So I I guess I'm looking at what's going to occur between now and the rapture. Well, the fact is, the Bible doesn't speak to this. It doesn't talk about the uh, financial situation of the world or the war situation. There's... There's the, there are uh, depressions, recessions, there are wars, rumors of wars uh, going on all the time, all through history. And uh, how this one will end, we don't know. Maybe it's all going to turn around and, and uh, the world is going to look a whole lot better financially before the end. It makes no difference. The end is coming. It has nothing to do with the economy. It has nothing to do with the uh, how many nuclear bombs there are, or or, or how uh, much uh, global warming, warming there is, or or what's happening to the icebergs. It has nothing to do with any of these things. It but, is but it only are, has to do with God's plan. But there are some signs that lead you to know that the end is near. And that's oh the no, the that. signs that we know the end are there. Uh, they, they're not. There are no signs that we can look at and say. This proves something. Uh, we, we, in order to know that the end is there, we have to look at the language of the Bible. When we work through the numbers of the Bible and uh, very, very carefully and very accurately, as God opens our eyes, then we come 
uh, to a very precise information and proofs to back it up that this, that May 21, 2011 is the date of the rapture and the first day of the day of judgment. And it has nothing to do with what we see in the world, even though the signs show us that we must be getting near the end because of the enormous amount of wickedness that is in the world. And it does look like the world is wearing out. But those are not going to give us any detailed information of time at all. And uh, But we get that right from the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. I was wondering if you could um, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in which verse? Uh, verses 7 through 16. I'm sorry, 7 through 16? Yes, please. So that contrary wise, ye would rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest this is talking about someone who's been excommunicated uh, and now to be very kind in bringing him back. And therefore, verse 8 says, Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. In whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For I forgive forgave anything to whom I forgave it for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices furthermore when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened unto me of the Lord I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother but taking my leave of them I went from thence into Macedonia now thanks be unto God, which always ca causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the Savior of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the Savior, or the fragrance of death unto death, and to the other the Savior, or fragrance of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? Now what is your question? How, how does this relate to the individual person um, in the times in which we're living today? How can we each take this as a personal... Well, what do you mean? Person? How does this relate to each, out of each of us? Yes. Well, it's uh, emphasizing, first of all, that we should be very forgiving, very, very forgiving. It's a, it's a further development of, of the statement that Jesus said, how often... When he was asked, how often do we forgive? He said, 70 times 7. We have to be very loving and uh, very forgiving. And, uh, and uh, secondly, we have to recognize that the Word of God is a two-edged sword. Yes, on the one hand, it does uh, is used of God to bring us to salvation. Uh, as God applies it to our hearts and lives. But on the other hand, it can also... Uh, bring us into further condemnation if we are if we are not trusting that word at all. For example, in our day, when God is commanding us to listen to the fact that that we're two years and two months away from Judgment Day, and if we're paying no attention, we don't want to listen. We we mock the Bible, we scorn the Bible, we we are. Uh, convinced that our church is teaching it right when it says Christ is coming as a thief in the night and so on. Well, that that's very, very serious business because we're not trusting the Word of God and it means that we're going to be included in, with those who will end up at the Day of Judgment. For but people. thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. That's good. I know you can't answer this question because uh, you said you couldn't at this, at, uh, well, it was just last week there when a couple callers called concerning Amos 1 and Zechariah 14.5. <coughs> I have a suggestion maybe you might want to check out 
in Amos 1, well, 1 through chapter 3, you keep hearing the words uh, roaring, and that has to do, uh, doing a word study on that, it has to do with uh, uh, giving out the gospel boldly, and uh, that's in verse 2 of Amos 1. And um, Zechariah, it says two years before the earthquake in Amos 1 1, and Zechariah 14 5. It doesn't say two years before the earthquake. It just says in the earthquake in the days of Uriah. Uh, so it's looking back in uh, Zechariah 14.5. But I think the gist of it, uh, the meaning of the two-year warning before the earthquake, if you do a word study on this word roaring, has to do with uh, getting out the gospel proclaiming. In fact, you mentioned it a couple days ago uh, about the earthquake. It's like a warning, and uh, I believe you're right. And uh, just looking at the verse roaring and uh, in uh, verse two of Amos one, it just has everything to do with getting out the gospel. When you read uh, chapter one through three, so I just thought maybe you might want to give that some thought. Yeah, well, the, you mean the first three verses? The first three chapters, yeah. uh, uh, one through uh, three, uh, to take get the whole context. You keep hearing. And well, I'll send a uh, fire uh, and for it. three transgressions and for four. In other words, God has a limit to his judgment. And uh, you, you'll you hear uh, the, the word repeated, and I, I will send a fire. It's talking about judgment uh, coming upon the world. Well, yeah, of course, the whole book of Amos is in view. Uh, in fact, the whole Bible is in view. We have to read these verses in the light of the whole Bible. But to uh, there are individuals in... Uh, and I could be included among them or, that are trying to find something more specific and and, uh, and it may be that there is nothing more specific, that you're absolutely correct that God is simply emphasizing that that uh, uh, the, uh, these are general statements that, re that relate to, to uh, getting the gospel out at any time. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Uh, uh, welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping? Yes. I actually was on hold. Um, the guy didn't take my call, so maybe they're having a problem in the answering room. I don't know. But anyway, um, I want to go to uh, Isaiah 45 7, please. Isaiah 45? Yeah, verse 7. I actually was the last caller last night, but I didn't get to get my questions in, so I hope you don't mind that I called. Back to get well, I do. I really, oh. I, you really shouldn't call twice. You know, even though uh, you may have felt you were a little bit shortchanged, you oh, have okay. to remember we have thousands of people trying to get in. Every now and sure. then, we'll get a call. They say, "I've tried for for 19 months to get in, and I don't know how some can get in almost at will. I don't know how that's all done, but uh, but we want to think in terms of others and." And oh. I, uh, if you I, have, I, a, yes, you have a question, uh, others will eventually ask it in any way. But we'll look at this for just a second. Well, Verse I, I seven. usually don't call, but once every two months, and I and I didn't know that you would mind, so I won't yeah. do that again. Don't worry. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherd of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth what makest thou? Or thy work, he hath no hands. Or make us that. Or, or thy work, he hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Now, what is your question? Yeah, forty-five, verse seven. Yes, I was looking at it. I, oh, oh, I didn't read that. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, Jehovah, do all these things. I mean, your question is about I create evil. Yes, sir. Yeah, and the evil that God creates is anything that an earthquake is an evil thing, and, and God takes full responsibility for it. Uh, the uh, fact that man dies is an evil thing, and yet God takes full responsibility for it. The fact that uh, this earth is going to be destroyed uh, on the last day, that's an evil thing, but God takes full responsibility for it. Now, he doesn't... Uh, sin also is evil, but God does not take any responsibility for sin. That's man's sin. That's a different matter altogether. 
but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. I want to ask you a question about a marriage. Um, if, if you were married, but you were married in civil court, are you allowed to marry again, but this time in church? It has nothing to do with how you got married. You could, uh, If you're married in accordance with the law of whatever okay. land you live in, you are married in the eyes of God. And uh, you, uh, if you marry a second time while your former spouse is living, uh, you are violating the law of God. Now, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campton. Um, I really don't call much. And um, it's like my... I called you a couple years ago. Oh, hold on a minute. I called a couple years ago. Hold on. And I want to ask a question about Matthew. Right. Uh, excuse me. Would you turn your radio off to begin with? That'll help. Yeah, I'll turn uh, it off. Uh, and I you, have a know about you have a Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. Right. Let's look at that. Matthew 24, verse 14. There we read, And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Right, and we're saying we, we're going to end in two years, and if it's got to preach to all the nations, you know... Well, I'm gonna... the, but you see, the, just think of what has happened in our day. If we were living uh, 50 years ago, we would say, oh, come on, how can that be possible? A church sends a missionary over to uh, a tribe someplace, and, and that missionary will minister maybe to a few hundred people in his whole lifetime but there are billions of people how will we ever minister to them but, but then because... excuse me then during the last 30 years the whole business of communication uh, became a, a brand new thing uh, useful to the world of course to peddle their their kind of thing they want people to hear about but uh, certainly available to those who bring the gospel so that today by means of internet by means of of uh, shortwave radio and AM radio FM radio uh, and uh, satellite broadcasting we're able to get the message of the gospel into the whole world into the whole world uh, that we never would have expected that would ha happen 50 years ago we'd say no way that'll never happen but it did and uh, and so this prophecy uh, is certainly completely uh, taken care of insofar as being a condition for the end of the world but it's thank easy. you okay Mr. Captain thanks thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Yes, Brother Camping. Yes. I'm calling, and I want to refer to Isaiah 55, Isaiah, verse 8 and 9. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. Let's look at that. Fifty-five, verse 8 and 9. There we read, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, saith Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, what is your question? My question is this. You state that um, the world will be coming to an end on May 21, 2011. In this verse, it clearly says that God's thoughts is greater than man's thoughts, and his ways is greater than our ways. How can you, as a man make a determination that the world will come to an end at that day. 
even the angels in heaven don't know the day. So what authority do you base that determination from? Well, the reason is that God has more to say. He, this is one thing that he says, and we certainly don't know. God hasn't taught us how he could speak and bring this complex world into existence. He hasn't taught us about uh, uh, exactly what will happen when we're in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, he's given a few thoughts, but uh, he hasn't detailed it at all. There's all kinds of things he hasn't taught us. But on the other hand, there are things that he said he will teach us. Read Amos 3, verse 7. Amos 3, verse 7. This also came from the mouth of God. Surely the Lord Jehovah will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. In other words, God tells us, well, he told Noah when he was going, and the people of Noah's day, the very day when he was going to destroy the world with the water. He told the Ninevites in the book of Jonah the very day when he was getting ready to destroy them. And by the same token, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. In his divine mercy and love for this world, he tells us the exact day when the, the end of this world will be. That all fits together with, a, with great, great uh, perfection. And we can be so thankful that we have that kind of a God. But shall we take our last call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, you gave some false information about Romans 11:26. The Jews will not turn to Jesus Christ until after the rapture of the church, when the tribulation period begins. This is clearly stated in Zechariah 12, verses 9 and 10. Let's look at that. Yeah, now excuse me just a minute. It says here that this blindness will be there until the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. In other words, as long as there remains one person in the whole world to become saved, that blindness will still be there. Now, I don't care where you want to place the rapture or, or whatever, or the tribulation, the, uh, all of those plans call for some more salvation to go on afterwards. And God is saying, not so, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And that, that locks it in, that it will be all the way till the end of the world. But now we have come to the end of our time, the Lord willing. We will be back together tomorrow evening for another edition of the Open Forum. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you.